Voice leading is the art of arranging multi-part harmony such that the various notes within each chord lead gracefully to the notes in the next chord that follows. Voice leading applies to simple two-part vocal harmony in folk music through arrangements for a jazz big band or orchestrating an entire classical symphony. This musical fragment we saw earlier shows how adding a seventh helps propel the C chord to the F that follows. You'll notice two things in this example. First, the top notes in the chords form a simple descending melody line that gives direction. The other is that notes within the C7th chord lead nicely to notes in the F chord that follows. In this case, the B-flat and the C7th chord lead strongly to the A note, and the E note leads strongly to the F that follows. In this example, both the B-flat and E notes are called leading tones. The C note at the bottom of each chord is also part of the structure, providing a commonality for all three chords that helps bind them together. Earlier I mentioned changing chords while the bass note stays the same, and this is another example of that. When I went to music college years ago in the 1970s, one of the most valuable lessons they taught was how to analyze the four-part arrangements in J.S. Bach's vocal chorales. Four-part vocal writing is a staple for groups ranging from the Baroque era through barbershop, big band jazz, and even pop groups such as the Beach Boys. The four standard parts, from highest to lowest, are soprano, alto, tenor, and bass, often abbreviated SATB. Voice leading is the key to successful four-part writing, and it's important for leading tones to resolve up or down as appropriate, rather than jumping aimlessly to any random note in the target chord. Before we look at examples of good four-part arranging, let's first look at some bad examples. This will help you appreciate the difference. One of the first things you'll learn in an arranging course is to avoid parallel fourth and fifth intervals, unless you're going for an oriental sound. The notes in all of these two-note chords are a fifth apart. Sure, this sounds sort of like harmony, but to my ears it's not very satisfying. Here's a similar ascending line that's harmonized in sixths instead of fifths. It sounds better overall, and the resolution at the end also sounds more final and more musical, because the leading tone resolves in the proper direction. Extending this to three-part harmony, it's still best to avoid parallel fourths and fifths. Rather than raise the G note in the first chord to an A in the second, it's better to leave it alone. Likewise for the C notes in the third and fourth beats. Again, the point here is not to teach music arranging, but to show what different types of voice leading sound like, both good and bad. Here again are the first six bars from Bach Chorale No. 8, one of my favorite works from the literature. A full analysis of the entire piece is beyond the scope of this tutorial, though that's available on my website linked in the description for this video. The goal here is to highlight some of the internal note progressions within each part. This type of music is often printed on the piano staff, with the note stems pointing up or down to identify which voice is which. These notes are the soprano part, and these are the alto part. Likewise for the tenor and bass parts in the lower staff. Here's what this excerpt sounds like when played on an organ, though I used a synthesizer for the bass line to make it easier to pick out the bass notes. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention my college music theory teacher, Dr. David Barnett, professor of music at the University of Bridgeport. Dr. Barnett was a huge influence for me, and he was also a world-class pianist who often performed publicly. Note the fermata symbol above the end of every second bar. This half circle with a dot tells the player to sustain that note or chord longer than the written duration. You may have noticed this effect as the music played. Looking first at just the top melody line, all of the movement is simple half steps and whole steps. The bass line at the bottom is similar, except for the occasional 5 to 1 jump. The inner lines are also mostly stepwise. The bass notes in most pop music are the root of the chord, but in this piece the bass line is the root, then the seventh, then the third, then the fifth. 
I imagine Bach tossed off this exquisite example of four-part arranging in only a few minutes, though I'm not ashamed to say it took me a few hours to analyze all 20 bars when I was in music school. Using notes other than the root for bass lines is related to chord inversions mentioned earlier because the bass note is the lowest note in the piece. The same methods and rules apply to arranging for a jazz big band. Voices should lead smoothly from one chord to another with minimal motion, and fourth or fifth intervals moving in parallel are best avoided. Harmony lines in thirds and sixths can move together, but other chord tones generally stay in place as the main harmonies pass through the intermediary chords. This score shows 24 bars of a big band arrangement I wrote years ago for the jazz standard Bluesette by Toots Thielmans. I made this cheesy synthesizer arrangement so you can hear it. This score shows only the five saxophone parts plus the bass, but the original was written for a jazz big band with a full brass section, piano, guitar, and drums. You can see three different key signatures in this piece. The bass part is in B flat, which is the actual key of the piece, but saxophones are transposing instruments. This means the notes that sound are offset by some interval from what's written. Wind instruments come in many shapes and sizes, with many variations, each optimized to produce a specific range of notes. For consistency and ease of playing, the same fingerings are used for each instrument in a family. So the fingering to play middle C on a tenor sax also works on the alto sax, but a tenor sax plays the B-flat a whole step lower than the written C, while the alto sax sounds a major sixth lower. Likewise for the soprano sax, which sounds an octave higher than a tenor sax. From the player's perspective, the printed notes are fingered the same, but the pitches produced are different. The composer or arranger is responsible for transposing the written notes to create the desired pitches. If I am reading a, a piece of music for soprano saxophone and it says, play a C, I would play a C like that. And also if I was reading a piece of alto saxophone music that said play a C, it would still be this fingering, but it's a different note. It's a fourth away. Here is a C on the soprano saxophone. This is a C on alto saxophone. This lead sheet shows the melody and chords, which was the basis for the harmonies. The long curved line over the first six notes is called a slur, and it tells brass players or singers that those notes are to be played or sung in one continuous breath to create an effect called legato. Without a slur, each note would be articulated separately. The opposite of legato is staccato, where each note is separated from the next by playing it for a shorter duration than written. Slurs on string parts have a similar meaning to indicate that all of the notes are played using a single bow stroke without changing the bow direction. We'll examine these playing styles in more detail later. Note the bottom line where all four F notes are tied together. All of the notes are the same pitch, so this is called a tie rather than a slur, though the effect is the same. The notes are played or sung with one breath or one continuous bow stroke. In other words, these notes are tied together to create a single note that extends for longer than one bar. Also note the Greek delta symbol, which is shorthand for major. The first chord in this piece is a B-flat major ninth, so the delta means a major seventh chord with an added ninth. Also note the measure numbers at the start of each line. In longer pieces, this lets the band leader identify specific places in the music. For example, let's go back to bar 57 and try that again. This score shows all five saxophone parts on one staff in the same key, which is how the arrangement was created. Once I was satisfied with the harmonies, I split each part to a separate staff, then transposed the notes to match the native key of the saxophone type that plays the part. If you care to analyze each chord, you'll see the basic harmonies are in thirds or sixths, and the other notes are chord tones that stay in place as the melody notes pass through them. You may have noticed that this tune is largely based on the circle of fifths mentioned earlier. Because the chords cycle through a number of different keys, many flats and naturals are needed. In fact, a piece like this is called chromatic because there are so many internal key changes. Notice the occasional accidental in parentheses. 
accidental supply only for the duration of the current bar, but as a courtesy to players, it's customary to remind them that an accidental no longer applies in the following measure. So if a note is flatted in one bar, a natural in parentheses is shown in the next bar. Again, my goal isn't to teach musical arranging, so we'll leave this for now. A huge amount of music to study can be found online, and full scores for every major classical composition are available for purchase. I'll mention that the most difficult thing for beginners to deal with when analyzing scores is navigating all the different keys that are used simultaneously for the various transposing instruments. Not only keys, but clefs too, such as the tenor clef that's sometimes used for cellos and trombones, and the viola's alto clef, which puts middle C on the middle line of the staff. But dedicated students eventually overcome that, and reading scores only gets easier with practice. There are literally hundreds of common chord progressions, and an important musical concept called substitutions allows altering a progression for variety. Instead of using the normal chord for a given progression, a different related chord is substituted. I can't say that Louie Louie is particularly interesting, but it's a useful example of substitution in a simple song. A typical rock progression uses the 1, 4, and 5 chords. In the key of C, these are C, F, and G. Louis Louis substitutes a minor 5 chord for the normal major, so G major becomes G minor. Here's the same progression twice, first with G major and then with G minor. The basic progression is the same, but you can hear that the flavor changes slightly. So one common substitution replaces a major chord with a minor version of the same chord, or vice versa. Earlier I mentioned the concept of relative major and minor, such as C major and A minor. These keys are related because both have no sharps or flats. To make a major scale you start on the C note and go up or down from there, and for a minor scale you instead start with the A note. Both chords contain notes from the same scale, and in fact both chords are almost the same. Adding a G to an A minor chord, or an A to a C major chord, creates a new ambiguous chord that could be either A minor 7th or C 6th. Which name is appropriate depends in part on which note the bass is playing. Of course, the bass can play any note in the chord, so it's really up to the songwriter or arranger to decide what a given chord should be called. Likewise for the B diminished chord mentioned earlier as the 7 chord for the key of C. This can also be considered as a G 7th chord with its third, the B note, in the bass. So you can see that it's not a stretch to replace a G chord with a B minor or a B diminished, and vice versa, because both chords share most of the same notes. Indeed, using substitutions is a big part of how jazz works, and good players use substitutions routinely to vary a tune from one verse to the next. A common substitute for the standard 4-5-1 progression used in rock music replaces the 4 chord with its relative minor, the 2 chord. Another common substitution is to replace a 5 chord with a flat 2 chord. So instead of 2-5-1, you use the descending pattern 2 to flat 2 to 1. In the key of C, this is D minor, D flat major, then C major. Here's what these variations sound like. Note that the last example shows an exception for avoiding parallel fifths. This exception is allowed because the chords themselves are descending. A downward half step can be used with any target chord, and another common variation is a flat 6 to 5. This earlier example of A minor, G, F, and E in Hit the Road Jack by Ray Charles uses a downward half step from F to E. In this context, the F could be considered a flat 2 for the E that follows. Years ago, entertainer Steve Allen made a wonderful video to teach jazz piano without having to read music. It shows many tricks and licks, and explains jazz chords without needing to learn advanced music theory. Thankfully, this video is still available, and a link to purchase the DVD is in the comments for this video. Even if you don't play the piano, or any other instrument, it's a fascinating and fun video. One trick Steve shows that I like is playing a D major chord above a C major chord. Voila, an instant 13th jazz chord. This works in any key. Just add a second chord a whole step above, though it's best to put the higher chord an octave away from the lower chord to avoid a clash from many nearby disparate notes. 
This example is more like a true 13th chord because it adds the 9th, 11th, and 13th notes. The only in-between color note missing is the 7th. And since the 7th is missing, this chord is tonic rather than dominant. Substitutions can also be established by the bass player. When I played in bands years ago, one of my favorite tricks was changing a 7 chord to a minor 5 chord by playing a 6th in the bass, as in this fragment from On Broadway. The regular chords play C to B flat repeatedly, but instead of playing a B flat, I'd sometimes play a G note. This turns the B flat chord everyone else in the band is playing into a G minor 7th, as you can hear in the last few bars of this example. The last aspect of melodies and harmonies we'll consider is how loudly they are played, and how their loudness varies over time. The general term for this is dynamics, and it's a very important property of music that makes all the difference between a soothing lullaby and a bombastic fanfare. This bassoon part from my cello concerto in A minor shows several dynamic markings. The first is forte, abbreviated as an italic F, which tells the musician to play fairly loudly. Forte means strong in Italian. The second instruction is mezzo piano, abbreviated MP. This means medium soft because the Italian for soft is piano and mezzo is the word for medium. There's also mezzo forte, abbreviated MF, which means medium loud. Finally, fortissimo and pianissimo mean very loud and very soft, respectively. Italian is the standard language used for written music instructions, and all classical musicians know at least the most common Italian musical terms and abbreviations. As an aside, the full name for the piano instrument is pianoforte, which means soft, loud, and the common name piano is simply a shortened version. The piano was invented around 1700 to let players control the volume of the notes for more expressiveness. Earlier keyboards, such as the harpsichord, play all notes at the same volume, no matter how hard the keys are struck. Therefore, the pianoforte was so named because it allows playing notes both softly and loudly. Besides telling musicians how loudly to play generally with forte, mezzo piano, and so forth, additional instructions indicate to play progressively louder or softer. The standard terms are crescendo and decrescendo for progressively louder and softer, respectively. Some composers write those words into the score in parts, but hairpin marks are often used as a shorthand. This example also shows a dynamic marking called an accent that applies to single notes. This is the greater than symbol above some of the notes. An accent tells the musician to play just that one note louder than all the others, to add emphasis or to better define the beat. Many accents are on the first beat of a bar, as in this example, but they don't have to be. Two other dynamics markings are forte piano and sforzando. Forte piano means play loud, then suddenly get soft, and is not to be confused with the piano forte instrument name. Sforzando is similar, but played even louder initially, with more force as shown here. <laughs> I explained earlier that it's common to include measure numbers in printed music to make it easier for musicians and conductors to locate specific places in a long piece. It's also common to identify the start of major sections with a letter as shown here, so the conductor can tell an orchestra, take it again from letter J. The seven in this bassoon part is a multi-measure rest that indicates seven bars where nothing is played. Sometimes rests are extremely long, and it's difficult for musicians to count 53 bars without losing track of where they are. To help players resume at the right place and avoid an embarrassing mistake, it's common to include cue notes played by other instruments, so they know what to listen for before their entrance. These clarinet and flute notes are in a smaller font to show that they're cues rather than part of the bassoon music. Also note the solo and tutti markings. Most of this part is meant for two bassoons playing the same notes in unison, but in a few places only one bassoon is to play. 
Solo means only the first bassoonist should play those notes, and Tutti resumes with both players in unison. When two bassoons are to play in harmony from the same music, by convention, the first bassoonist plays the higher note. Usually measure numbers appear only at the left side of the page for each staff, but additional numbers, like the 140 shown here, help players more easily navigate the music when there are many measures of rest, as is common with percussion parts. There are an infinite number of ways to create melodies, and it's not my intent to present a course on songwriting or orchestra arranging, so I'll just show a few examples of what I call musical devices that are commonly used. A pedal tone, also called a pedal point, is a low note that stays the same as other notes above it change to form different chords. In this case, the word pedal derives from the foot pedals that play bass notes on a pipe organ. A pedal tone can be a note from the other chords, or it can be unrelated to create dissonance. Because the bass note stays the same, it adds a commonality to the chords in a passage, even when there's dissonance. A great example of a pedal tone is the Motown hit, You're All I Need to Get By, by Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. As you can hear, the bass stays on an A note as the chords go from 1, then to 2, then to a minor 4. So first that A note is the root of the A chord, then it's the 7th of the B7-2 chord, then the 5th of the D minor 4 chord, and finally back to A. Pedal tones are also used in Spanish classical guitar music, where both the bottom and top E notes stay the same as the inner chords go from E to F to G and back. This example is shown in the key of E because that's how it's played on a guitar. The second chord is an F major 7th because E is the 7th note in the F major scale and for the G chord, those E notes are the sixth of a G scale. Continuing the same melody note across different chords is another common device, as in the jazz standard One Note Samba by Antonio Carlos Jobim. This is just a little samba built upon a single note. Other notes are bound to follow, but the root is still that note. Now this new just as chords can change under a single sustaining melody note or bass line, they can also change under a repeating melody pattern. Another musical device progressively lowers the root note of a minor chord to create a continuous progression. You've probably heard this one many times, where the root note is lowered by half steps. Led Zeppelin used this progression in Stairway to Heaven. And George Harrison used the exact same chords in While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Two other common melody devices are the appoggiatura and the escape tone. An appoggiatura is a stepwise movement, either a half step or a whole step, that's often preceded by a larger leap. The opening three notes of Maria and Somewhere from West Side Story are good examples. Maria, I've just kissed a girl named Maria. An escape tone is the opposite, where a half step or whole step is followed by a large jump, as in this example from the variations on a Rococo theme for cello and orchestra by Tchaikovsky. There are also what I call musical rhymes. 
Like word rhymes, a similar melody is repeated with small changes, as in this example. Another musical rhyme is in the theme for the movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Related to musical rhymes are what I call musical echoes, where one instrument plays a melody that's then repeated by another instrument. In this example from my cello concerto, a cello line is echoed first by a solo flute, then by a solo clarinet the second time. Another musical device is called counterpoint, which uses two or more voices that move independently, but together create a harmony as the notes overlap and intertwine. A well-known example of counterpoint is the many Bach inventions, including this one. A musical surprise is an event that's unexpected, such as a brief loud moment in a soft, gentle passage, or a chord that defies the typical resolution. One example is the Picardy Third, where a minor piece ends surprisingly on a major chord. This device has been used in classical music for many centuries, but a modern example is the ending of Happy Together by the Turtles. However, any chord or note that's unexpected can be considered a surprise, as in the last chord of this simple example that goes up a half step from an E7 to an F, rather than resolving back to the usual A minor like the first time. <laughs> 